Okay, so hi everyone. We are officially live on the Daisy Collective's Facebook page. My name is Rahama Malik, and I am very happy to be moderating the uh, first session of the Writer's Block Festival, which is titled Playing with the Boundary, a Deep Dive in Science Fiction and Fantasy. So we're joined today by three wonderful authors um, who all have books coming out slash that are already out. Um, first up, we have Usman Tanvir Malik, who is a Pakistani-American writer and doctor who spends his time between Orlando and Lahore. His fiction has won the Bram Stoker Award and the British Fantasy Award. And along with Desi and Bawaja, Usman is the co-founder of the Salam Award for Imaginative Fiction, which aspires to find and nurture speculative fiction writers of Pakistani origin. Usman's debut collection, Midnight Doorways, Fables from Pakistan, will be out in early 2021. We also have with us Shweta Takrar, who <laughs> has an amazing bio where she is a part-time Nagini and a full-time believer in magic. Her work has appeared in a number of magazines and anthologies, including Enchanted Living, Uncanny Magazine, and Toil and Trouble. Her debut young adult fantasy novel, Star Daughter, is art out now from Harper Teen. And finally, we have with us Isabel Yap, who writes fiction and poetry, works in the tech industry, <laughs> and drinks tea. She was born and raised in Manila and has also lived in California and London. Her debut short story collection, which is titled Never Have I Ever, will be published by Small Beer Press in 2021. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, so to kick things off, I think it's always fun to find out where authors get their ideas from, especially with a genre as rich as speculative fiction. So I just kind of want to start off by asking each of you, what did you read when you grew up? And what was it that made you all decide that this was the genre that you wanted to work with when you decided to become writers? Do you want to start with someone? <laughs> sure, Usman, you can start. <laughs> um, well, I grew up reading mostly in Urdu. I did not read much in English till I was 12 or 13, I think. So my grounding was very heavily Urdu dominant. Um, so in Urdu, I remember, you know, in Pakistan, as you know, Rahama, we had these magazines called Bachongi Dunya, Bachonga Baal, Jugnu, Aankh Macholi, Talim Utrbiyat. And so some of the, those mags were really heavily moral uh, leaning moralistic and uh, you know they were like good morals for children sort of magazines i hated them <laughs> so i always went for the fantasy ones like bachongi dunia where there were stories about magic and fantasy so i pretty much grew up in that milieu i never realized i was you know that might be where spec my spec my love for spec came from but i guess that must be it um and then later on obviously i switched to english and discovered you know all the classics uh, Martin, uh, uh, Tolkien, Tolkien um, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, and whatnot. Is it out? Yeah, I was thinking about this question. There's like almost two parts to it. Like, what were you reading growing up? And then how did you land on writing spec fic? Um, for me, growing up, I feel like my, I, I read whatever I could. And like in the Philippines, we didn't, it's not like you really have public libraries. So if you re read books, you always have to basically buy them. My school had a pretty good library. So it had a lot of like fairy tales. It had this book series called the Bailey School Kids um, where they, they would like, I think one of the books was like, my teacher's a gremlin or something like that. So it did have like a lot of supernatural creatures. Um, but I was also reading a ton of like, you know, realistic fiction um, like Babysitter's Club and I don't know, Nancy Drew notebooks and stuff like that. So I, I read whatever was available in the library or in the bookstore, I guess, which it didn't have like that much of a selection. Um, I also really loved anime and manga and I still do. So those plus video games really inform a lot of like what I like to write. Um, I think it's just like tends to be fantastical. Um, but I will say like, I don't think I, I wrote like I don't think that was why I wrote speculative fiction. The reason why I started writing spec fic was because there was an open call for submissions to a Philippine anthology that was Philippine speculative fiction. And since I was just trying to get published at that time, I thought, okay, let me create a story for this and it has to be speculative. So that's what I will write. Um, if the anthology had been for lit fic, then I probably would have written lit fic. So I think I, it was a little bit of a mercenary choice to just be like, this is what is accepting stories for publication. That is what I will write. And then it sort of continued from there. 
Nice. And Shweta? I love all our different answers. And mine is going to be, <laughs> mine is going to be kind of weird because I have always, like ever since I can remember, I have just carried rich imaginary worlds inside me. I would just daydream all the time. I would, I actually, when I was younger and I still hope this comes back one day, I could actually feel magic in the air. It was amazing. And so there was never any, so I guess I'm answering the second part first. There's never any question that I would write this. And so, but I, but like Isa, I read all kinds of stuff growing up, lots of fairy tales, Amr Chitra Kata comics, which, you know, for anybody who's watching and doesn't know, are uh, comics for kids from South Asia that retell a lot of our stories, like our epics and things in digestible form for children. And so I learned a lot of, of those stories that way and, you know, watched, you know, lots of Shira and of the eighties and just, you know, whatever, or, but also read things like the Babysitter's Club. I mean, I loved it all, I, you know, we're readers. So it just pulled it all in, but, but then I would also just, I don't know, just daydream. And, and then uh, when, and I just, when I started to look around in my mid twenties and when I decided to start writing seriously and I realized like I didn't see us anywhere in the books that I read, especially in the fantastical ones, I, you know, and where was our mythology? Like, you know, like Usman has these amazing stories with Jin, for example, where the hell were they? Like, you know, where were the Upsidas? Like, where were all these things? And where were the people who looked like us? So I said, I, you know, I was going to do something about it, but and I had been very inspired by the Nuja Desai Ida's uh, Born Confused, which was the first South Asian YA in the North American market, the first novel like that. It was contemporary, but when I read it, when I was I said, 23, I think, yeah, I was just like, this can, wait, there's a book about someone like me, oh my God. And so I wanted to do the enchanted version of that, as it were, which ended up being Star Daughter, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, I think it's always fun when people start out reading very diverse things, but then they, there's always that moment when you chance upon it and you're like, ah, this is the thing that, that I want to contribute to when I grow up or when I, when I do things. Um, and coming to the act of writing itself, I think there's always this image of the writer or writing being this very solitary profession where you're kind of toiling away in your respective writing spaces and things. Um, but community is something that I've noticed through social media and especially through Twitter because so many publishing houses and publishers now do these massive threads on trends and things that are happening. Um, and I know for YA, the Bookstagram community is very active on Instagram. You know, they have those wonderful setups of the latest books that they've bought and things. And so I wanted to ask like, how did you all go about finding your communities in these spaces? And what would you recommend as a starting point for someone who maybe can't make it to, you know, I mean, given the times we're living in, in-person writers meetings and things, and, and even events like this aren't happening in person. So what would you recommend to someone who's starting out and wants to look for a community? And anyone can start us off with us. Could I, could I, because I actually have thoughts on this, if that's all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the internet was actually a blessing for me in this case, because I was actually answering this question last night about, you know, who are, who in your life is really supportive of your, your writing? And I thought about it. I was like, nobody. And, and I don't mean this is a sad thing. It just wasn't the case. Like my parents were very practical minded about what I should be doing. So, so I'm laughing about that. I ended up being a, a professional author anyway. Sorry. <laughs> but, the, you know, so just thinking about that and I, I actually came into the internet scene in about like 2003, 2004 with LiveJournal and LiveJournal, you know, is gone now, but it was, I think, really formative for a lot of us in the speculative community because we would find one another. We would find authors who were already, who, you know, we loved their books or we would find out about books. And there was this, this great community effect. LiveJournal was basically, was online blogging, long form blogging. And except it had a comment section. So you would log in and you would interact with the people writing. And so you start to find people like I met Holly Black that way. And that's how I ended up going to Clarion because I wanted to meet her and befriend her. And uh, while well, that didn't happen there, it did much later. But, you know, just you know, I started to discover things. I started to discover people. I started to find uh, other people who were doing similar things that I wanted to do, you know, have brown people in, in stories. And, uh, and who wanted to use our fairy tales, our mythology, whatever it might be. And so that was, so that was really helpful. And then when everybody started to transition to Twitter, that was really helpful. I mean, Twitter can be a trash fire. Let's, you know, there's no way about it to, but, but it can also be a wonderful way of finding people and 
finding about finding out about books. So that was super helpful for me. And I think my acknowledgement section for Started Art is probably going to be the longest one of any book I write because I had to thank so many people over the the you know the seven six or seven years that the book took to write and go to publication. But it, but you really do need community. So what I would recommend is, especially in this time of COVID. You know, if you're not on social media already, get on social media and look for the writers whose books you love and look for the communities around them and and start, you know, just getting involved in conversations, like not in a creepy way, don't hound anybody, but if you feel like you have something to reply to, reply and talk about books that you like and start following people and eventually they'll start following you back too. And before you know it, you will have a community, especially if you're if you're just starting out as a writer, it's so important to have people who can critique your work and whose work you can critique. And the best advice I ever heard about this, and I wish I could remember who said it, was if you can find people who are on your level and better, that's the way to go because they will challenge you and show you what you don't yet know. Thanks. Um, Isabel, if you wanna add something. Yeah, um, it's so funny. I. I am thinking about how I met like Usman and Shweta, for example, and like, why do we become friends? You know, it's kind of hard to remember these things, um, but thinking through sort of like practical advice, um, you know, I, I really agree with a lot of what Shweta said. I was also on Live Journal, though more um, from a fan fiction perspective, but when it came to pro writing, um, I really didn't know much about that world. It's like, even back then, I mean, the internet already existed, Twitter existed. I'm talking like 20, 2012, 2013. I just didn't really occur to me like how to publish. I, you know, I was still in that mindset, like publishing happens to people who live in New York. Um, growing up abroad, you just don't really think about how to get into that community. Um, and so I think, you know, one thing I like to stress, for example, when Filipino writers reach out to me is like, there's no physical like need to be somewhere in order to like publish. If you write a good story, you can email it to editors, you can submit it to magazines, like follow their guidelines, but you can be anywhere in the world and, and get published. Um, and the same thing goes for community. So Twitter is a really good place. And I do wanna stress like a lot of it has to do with like reaching out and like getting over your shyness, uh, getting over this feeling that I have nothing to say. I'm a little wee you know, worm <laughs> of a writer, like that we all think that, especially when we're starting out, but people are nice, they want to help. Um, if you do it in a conscientious way, if you like engage in the conversation thoughtfully, I think usually it works out well. Um, and, you know, it's also a matter of, I think, finding people who are in the same stage of the journey that you are in. Um, so people who are just beginning to write um, or people who are beginning to submit their work for publication, like all of you, can relate to each other better because you're kind of in the same stage of your career. And obviously you can look to people who are ahead in their careers as well, but it does make a difference when you're like engaging in the same sort of like specific woes of whatever stage you're in. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, I also found writing community through school. So I was kind of involved in the literary community in the Philippines briefly in my college um, and then same thing I just graduated from a master's program. Like I, I, I attended workshops there and I tried to find the other people at school who were also interested in writing. So if you're in an academic environment now, um, there are probably other people secretly writing around you. Even if your major has nothing to do with writing, my major is business, like someone's sneakily writing as well. So just talk about lo loving writing and maybe someone will approach you and say, I love it too. Um, let's talk about it, so. Thanks, Laura. Do you have um, anything to add? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> Shweta and Isa covered a lot, um, you know. <laughs> and uh, Rama, I do want to mention a couple of things about community and workshops. Um, you'll hear the name Clarion, Clarion West, and Odyssey uh, being thrown a lot in the science fiction, fantasy, and horror community. And um, there are two things about this. These are wonderful, wonderful workshops. And Clarion has been a source of community for science fiction, it used to be called the Milford Writing Workshop a long time ago. And it has been a source of community for the science fiction uh, world for a very long time, almost 70 years actually. Um, but there's absolutely no indication or reason for a person that they have to go to one of these workshops to become a writer. Um, that is, I wanna really say that off the, uh, uh, right, uh, right at the, before I start, because I don't want people to think that they're missing out on anything because honestly, 
you might never go to Clarion and then five years later, you might be going there as an instructor, which has happened to a friend, uh, a couple of people I know. So please don't worry about workshops as much. Uh, this is a question that does get tossed around. Um, if you can, if you have the resources and the money to do it and the privilege that you can travel, then for sure, I mean, it, it'll help. You'll find friends. It'll be a good experience. You'll learn quickly and it'll cut down on a couple of years of your writing career, maybe. But uh, it's not a it's not mandatory. So that's one. Two, in terms of community, I always tend to think about also what kind of community are you looking for? So um, what kind of writer are you? Are you the kind of writer who really um, is sustained by having more people around you and kind of bouncing ideas and you're energetic, you want to connect with them, but some people are not, and that's okay too. So, you know, you don't have to be, uh, go out all the time. And once, it, even if it's an online community, that's great. If it's a physical community, wonderful. Um, just don't force it upon yourself. You got to do what you, what is best for your craft and for your frame of mind. And that can change from year to year. Um, since we're talking about Desi writers, uh, so South Asians, um, Southeast Asia, maybe, um, I would say that folks in these part of the world, I would highly recommend using the internet wisely and succinctly. <laughs> try, to, try to use it in a way that is productive and not really counterproductive, uh, because you can really get involved in a lot of, you know, BS things that you really don't, you, I, I can guarantee you, you are never going to change another person's mind. So don't worry about changing people's mind, focus on craft, learn from writers, follow them, uh, steal all the tools you can from the biggest assholes of the planet if need be. <laughs> and just don't get into those sort of situation because it's going to be harmful to your writing energy. Um, I highly recommend a book called, um, about writing by Samuel R. Delaney for anyone. It doesn't matter if it's specific or not. And the other one I would strongly recommend that Chip Delaney recommended to me is called uh, Enemies of Promise by Cyril Connolly. These are two books that people should consider reading because they talk not about writing as a craft, but as writing as a life choice and the problems you're gonna encounter. Community, you know, sex, addiction, or, um, all those issues that people struggle with, uh, those books sort of delve into them. And I think that's all I have to say about that. Well, that's a wonderful bit of advice from each of you. Um, I think part of it is also just, yeah, what you all were saying that it's nice to have people to bounce around, but you might, that might not be necessarily where you thrive. And it might be to your betterment to wait until the very end to show someone something when you feel confident in it. Um, my next question was more to do with world building, since this is a spec fic panel. Each of you have built these wonderful, rich worlds for each of your um, writings, whether it's short stories or novels. Um, and so I wanted to ask, how do you go about building that world? Because a lot of the time, well, not a lot of the times, but the the fantasy or the horror or the science fiction aspect occurs in a very realistic setting. And so when you're building a story like that, do you still have to do a lot of research as compared to building something completely from scratch? And again, when you're, when you're introducing it in a real life setting, how much do you think you have to pay attention to the authenticity of those places themselves? Um, or do you just feel like you can do whatever you want and it should be, and it should work, it should be fine because the genre will maybe protect you from that kind of critique. So Shweta, why don't you start? Because you've already created a wonderful world for your novel. Okay, uh, well, thank you for saying that. Uh, I, I'm laughing at this question only because the typical advice given is you need to do, you know, you need to do all this research. You need to figure out what the economics of your society would be and how, how people eat. And I, and I don't do any of that at all. And I, that's probably great advice. But honestly, what I try to do is write the worlds that I want to go to. And so I just think about, again, wanting magic, right? So what are the what are the things that I would want? And that's why when we get to the reading portion of this, I'm actually going to read from my Magical Night Market chapter because that's I wrote that completely for myself and I love that it, people love it too. But it was all for me, like all the, all the things that I would want to be able to go shopping for. And so that's what I think about, like what, if I'm, if I'm trying to evoke a feel of the numinous, 
what does that mean? You know, what, what, how, how can I bring that? How can I paint with words on the page with that? And, and, but then you asked too about how to ground that. And I think that's really important because I, I don't always write contemporary fantasy, but this book in particular is that it starts out in New Jersey and, uh, and is very, you know, Desi family problem or <laughs> oriented. And, uh, and that was important to me too, because I think that I've thought about this a lot. When we talk about, for example, writing aliens in, in science fiction or some other horrific creature from in horror, right? That ultimately you want to, they need to be strange but they still have to be human. Otherwise we wouldn't know what to do with them as readers. And so I think that the same applies with world building that you can make all the fun stuff you want but they need to, but those, those elements need to be grounded in a sense of reality that actually lets them shine more if there's, an entrance point for the reader, because most of us, you know, I'm not going to say whether I do or not, whether I, you know, I'm so kind of, if I come from some magical world or not, you'll just have to guess. But the, for everybody who doesn't, there has to be an entry point. There has to be something they can hold on to. Otherwise it, it's like you have the, the frosting, but no cake. And while frosting can be delicious on its own, it starts to get sickeningly sweet and gives you a stomach ache if you don't have the cake to eat it with. So for me, having those those touches of quote unquote realism, like a, a perfect example, somebody had mentioned this when they were reading the book early to review it, that she feels auntie, her foy is, um, even though she's about to go up to Swarglok, right? The Hindu heavenly realm, that her auntie still packs, or her foy still packs her Tupperware food because she's so worried that she's also not gonna eat, right? Like that's, and I think all of us growing up in, um, Daisy families or Isabella, I imagine it's probably similar for you with family that like food is so important, right? Like they're going to just jam it down your throat. I remember when my maternal grandma was still alive, uh, when we last visited her in India and that was, uh, this is a while ago, but you know, and she stood like this tall to me and, and she kept telling me in Gujarati that I need to eat more. And I was like, well, well, bye, I'm, I'm full. And she was like, no, more, more. <laughs> like how, so I think those touches really matter because we need to be able to relate on the human part, a sense of the human level of all of this too. And then the magic can come in and give everything this beautiful golden glow, if that makes sense, so. <clears throat> Isabel? Um, I have a chip on my shoulder about world building. I feel like it's one of two things I don't do well or doesn't come naturally to me. It's world building and the other one is plot. So like, <laughs> life is hard as a writer. Um, but I, I feel like people have told me that's not true. Like your stories have good world in them. And I realized over time, I was thinking about world building in the sense that you know, it's like, yeah, the Game of Thrones sense or whatever, where it's like, you have to create a whole whatever. Um, and then I realized the world building that people reference when they say you're pretty good at it is just how lived in the story feels. And I feel like it really depends on the story. So um, there's two stories in my collection that take place basically in my like elementary school and high school, like a place that I lived in for I don't know, 13 years. It's like where I grew up. Um, it's Catholic all girls school set in Manila. Like I very specifically went to one and that's where I like became a person. <laughs> so I didn't have to do any research for it, right? Like I just know that place. And my research was going to my Barcada, my friend group and being like, hey, do you guys remember in high school? Like, didn't we do this weird thing? And then they would be like, yeah, we did this weird thing. And and then, you know, it's just memories, right? And so I, 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 bar I barely need to construct anything and there's nothing I need to research. But um, one of the stories that I'm working on now, I'm trying to set it in a world inspired by pre-colonial Philippines. And I, I can make stuff up, but my, my mind is full of like images from various things like anime, like video games, like all the fantasy I've read that isn't really set in that time period of the Philippines. And so I am researching, like I have bought, you know, obscure books. It's really hard to find texts about this period and all of it was written by Spaniards too, because colonialism, but you know, it's like, uh, maybe I set my, my, my project on hard mode, but it was kind of the project that I wanted to do. Um, and so the thing I realized is like, I just don't have the right textures in my, in my story if I try to write it the way, you know, just from like my brain. Um, I realized this because I showed like a part of it at a workshop a few years ago and someone was like I was imagining an Italian villa 
And I was like, oh no, it's like so far, like it shouldn't feel that way. Um, so you have to think about the story you're writing and then do enough research, I think, to get the textures right. And like I described, obviously, if you're writing from a place that you know, then that's just gonna come much more naturally. But you don't need to only write the places you know. I'm a huge advocate for it. Most of the stuff I write is set in Manila. Um, there's a few that are maybe in the States, but you know, I feel like especially writers of color, like you should be able to write whatever you want, um, but just put in the time and effort to make it good. Smile. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, Shweta and uh, Isa. Oh, so by the way, I'm going to and I ditto Isa on her not being able to do world building. I've read her work. So she's fantastic at world building. <laughs> Isa, I'm sorry you're wrong. Um, in terms of um, how I approach world building, you know, Isa made a really good point about um, setting, using settings that are familiar to you. Um, and I have done that a lot uh, with a lot of my stories. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm actually not that comfortable writing hard science fiction that's set on alien planets because um, that really requires a lot of work. Um, and, and, you know, when it comes to world building, Isa just said something at the end, uh, which um, is something I always think about. You gotta do your research. Uh, people think it's easy to create a new world, you know, uh, when when a lot of realist writers who tend to write realistic fiction, they're like, well, you know, we have to do our research, but you guys can just, uh, just you know, create this out of thin air. But world building is tough. It has its own, um, you know, you have pretty much sociology, economics, architecture, um, uh, uh, science, you have your physical principles. Everything has to be just right because readers are smart and readers will pick up when you start messing things up. So that's why when you do your research, it's so important to really understand your own world. If you don't know what you're doing, the reader is gonna sense that and they will pick up on it. And they do that all the time. Um, I can't tell you how many letters writers receive on this, where they, with a, a, a reader who's, I don't know, a reader has an expertise on gravestones and uh, the writer, the poor writer did like two days of gravestone research and then missed the shiny thing and he gets this letter, bam. You know, in your, in your story, the, this detail about gravestone uh, markings is totally wrong. So you, you're never gonna be 100% correct, but you gotta make sure you give it your good time, you spend uh, time on it. It has to be as authentic as possible. A general rule I've followed for the last decade in terms of how people think about world building and how people relate to setting is the more specific your setting, the more a reader anywhere in the world can relate to it. So it's actually, if you think about it, if you pause and think about it, it's kind of paradoxical. So you would say, why don't we have a generic setting, right? And every reader in the world can relate to it because they can superimpose their own idea of the world on it. it, it the human brain doesn't work that way. So when I was a kid, uh, 10 or 12, and I was reading Stephen King, I related better to his small towns than I did to my own city sometimes because he had described everything and I could feel it. Um, Another principle of world building that M. John Harrison talks about, and uh, M. John Harrison is a critic. He's a very, very well-respected science fiction writer. Um, he cautions writers about not doing too much world building. So what he says is know your world, don't show all of it. Just show enough that your readers, trust your reader to um, create the rest of your world. It has to be a parallel effort that's done together. If you do too much of it, you've left no work for the reader's brain to do. And I, when I first uh, came upon that idea, it really struck me because then later on, it does make sense because honestly, uh, Rohama, you're, uh, if I, you and I are sitting in Lahore, how much of Lahore do we really know if we go out? We don't. I definitely don't people. know a lot. <laughs> Yeah, we once we start, you know, moving out of areas that we don't know, all of a sudden things start changing. Even going from a liberty mm -hmm. market to a gully, things start changing. Right? Yeah. So um, th that's those are the few comments that I had. But before we go on, could I add one thing? I just wanted to say that I I may have come across sounding like I don't think research is important. And no, everything that that Usman said is right. It's just I. What I meant was I don't I don't tend to think in terms of those bigger 
practical questions, but that's also why I can get away with writing contemporary fantasy. And if I have to, if I ever do write something else, then I will need to look at those questions. And I totally agree with what both Isa and Usman said that you want to make your world feel lived in and you need to pick those choice details, which means you need to know what the world is like. You need to know how it works, how it functions, and then figure out how much of that to share on the page, which you know is, is always a delicate balance, but I agree. And I did have to do some research because one of the things that ends up happening in the West with marginalized authors is that we get, our books get posited as some kind of, our novels get posited as some kind of encyclopedia instead of a novel. So people, I, like I can't even tell you how many times I've seen people, reviews that say, oh, I came to this book because I wanted to learn. And I was like, but you don't know what the author made up like, because this isn't a novel, we should have the same freedom to do that, right? So I, and and also because I was born here in America, you know, I, there's a lot about, and Hinduism is, is so vast and the stories, and there's so much I don't know. And there's so many variations on the tales. And so I had to do a lot of research about that. I had to do, you know, research about Vedic astrology. I had to uh, look up stories. I mean, there's, so you're always going to do research. Like you're not, there's no getting out of it. You might as well just make it fun. It's just, I guess the question is, like Osman was saying, what kind of story do you want to tell will determine the research that you need to do. So. I'll also add on to just real quick, like a really great example of not doing research in like the way most people think about it is um, Neon Yang's Tensorate series. Um, they have talked about how they didn't do research on like Chinese culture. And it was just these like rem remembrances from like Wuxia films and what they wanted to see on the page. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting mix. Like history can teach you a lot, but we should also remember that we are writing fiction. Um, and so we have that, that freedom to do things. And, you know, I hard agree on like people wanting you to be the voice of the thing if you write from your own <laughs> culture, but you only have your own experiences to draw from. And then obviously all the reading that you've done, whether that's in nonfiction or fiction, um, and so, you know, I, I would like to encourage everyone to sort of like remove that pressure. It's hard. It's like always hanging over you. Um, but, you know, just tell the true story that you can. It's not about being the one voice for like everything in your culture because you can't be. Um, if I could add one last thing to Isa and Shweta, because I think they struck on something so important. I this is my personal opinion. And I, you know, this is just for me, I believe an artist or a writer, for me, represents only themselves. That's it. They don't represent a culture. They don't even represent a setting, a location. Because like I said, you move one mile from where my house is and the world changes. Everyone's experiences start changing. So hard ditto on what Issa and Shweta said about representation. Yeah, well, that's a great place um, because my next question was to do with representation because I think um, in publishing, or at least when I used to write, head a writer circle, there was very much, it was a writer circle primarily to do with speculative fiction. We were actually all mostly writing for Usman's uh, Salam Award, which was new at the time. And so everyone was writing and trying to build worlds and doing all of this. And I was frantically researching in a corner that how do I lead this thing and give good advice and things. Um, but one of the things that kept coming up with some of the participants was just this idea that oh, publishers abroad, because everyone has the dream of being published by Penguin or by the big uh, publishers. They were just like, oh, if we don't write about what they associate with Pakistan, we will never get a shot. So there was this real sense that, oh, I can't, like I remember vividly one of the participants, she had this wonderful story about a jinn and Sufism, and she was really going places with it. And then one week she stopped bringing in those chapters because she decided that she wanted to write about terrorism. And, you know, I asked her, I was like, you can definitely like, there's no rule that says you have to continue that story if you don't want to, but why are you doing this? And, you know, she genuinely was like, well, I want to be published by next year and I'm Pakistani. So if I don't talk about a, a bomb blast happening in my city, who will want to read it? And, you know, I think each of you in your work are very much representing yourselves, but also the cultures you've grown up with and the cultures that you're a part of. And so I think um, if you could each talk a bit about if you faced any resistance maybe, because I know Shweta, you've talked about um, 
I saw one of your talks where you were uh, saying about how the family structure is so important in a Desi family, but in YA, there's that trope of like the chosen one going by themselves and their parents are conveniently, you know, not in the picture. So they're able to do all of these things. Um, and for Isabel and Osman, I know that the locations in your stories are very much based on where you grew up and you can, you can understand that. And so I think it's important to kind of let people know that it's okay and that it's encouraged to, to again, like write what you know. So I guess I just wanted to see if any of you had had to face any pushback from when you were getting published or starting out or if someone said something like that to you. And Osman, you can maybe take this one first. Um, you know, um, in terms of writing, so I think what we're really talking about are expectations from the external world on the that are laid upon the artist's shoulders, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, even when uh, as a teen, you know, when I was reading books, um, I read, De I, lo I loved horror. So I, I read Dean Coons, I read Christopher Pike, R.L. Stein, Stephen King. And I use those, I, I, I'm choosing those four names specifically because the comparison between Pike and R.L. Stein was that after reading 10 R.L. Stein books, I could predict every single move. And I knew that what was going to happen. So I stopped reading all this time because there was nothing there. Christopher Pike, for me, on the other hand, every book was different. And I, I never knew what to expect. I, I knew it was going to be something different and I would love it. So Pike became a brand that I wanted to follow and Arl Stein did not. Um, similarly with Dean Coons, after five books, I knew what he was going to do and I was done with him. And I switched to Stephen King and I never got every time I knew there was going to be something different, something new. So in terms of expectations, you know, anytime we get, allow ourselves to get pinned down um, for, I don't know, Pakistan, India, war, um, Kashmir, terrorism, realism, poverty porn, whatever you want to call it, um, everyone is allowed to, you know, we're, obviously we're allowed to write about them, but um, to say that that is the only thing that we should be doing. And this does happen even now, 20 years later, this still happens. Some publishers do say that, some agents say that. And if you hear that, you really want to reconsider working with that agent. Um, because I think that that is going to constrain your uh, artistic ability. Um, if you have an agent, um, if, so sometimes agents will give you strategies, right? So an agent or an editor will say, okay, I think this is something you like you are someone who's open to it and uh, let's go for it. Why don't you do this particular series in this way? And that's fine. But if someone is saying only this is gonna sell and nothing else, they are wrong. I mean, they're just wrong. It doesn't work that way, especially in Specflick. They all want originality, they want new things. Even when YA was the big thing, um, as Shweta might tell you, why um, the world of YA doesn't operate anymore that way. People want NA, people want uh, diverse YA much more than they, they want own voices more now. So I, I think while I had some pushback on it initially, once I started selling professionally, happily, I escaped that. And I hope other people do too. Well, have you experienced anything like that? We cut out on, on who, who Hello? you are. The oh, sorry, I meant to you. <laughs> It just gave okay. me the, your internet connection is unstable pop up. Done. <laughs> um, yeah, I have like, I have like two thoughts about this topic that go in opposite, almost opposite directions. But one, I'll, I'll start with the one that was directly asked, which is like, you know, kind of like, what are the stories that you're allowed to tell? And do you only have to tell these like very dramatic, sad stories as a person from that culture? And I remember being a high school student and a college student in the Philippines. And like, if you read Filipino literature, it was all that. It was just like hyper depressing. Um, I, you know, like martial law, poverty, abortions, like just all, all of these like really heavy topics. Um, and it was that book series that Philippine speculative fiction that I published a story in. I was in volume number four was my first publication ever outside of school where I was like, oh, you can tell like other types of stories. You can tell stories about like our monsters and that kind of thing. And I just like loved them. I loved how like different they were. Um, you know, there was also also in high school in a love story collection, there was a story called The Dust Monster 
by this author, Hilda Cordero Fernando, that was just like a really quiet love story about a lady who goes up in her attic and there's like a dust monster in a suit who she falls in love with. And I was like, wow, it's like, there was no horrible thing in that book, in that story, but like the emotions were very real. Um, and it was just delightful to me as a reader. And so I kind of, I kind of would want writers to take the perspective of like, what do you want to read, you know? And it's hard when you don't have examples. Like I only realized it when I read examples of other people doing it, that that was a thing that could be done. Um, so to anyone listening now, you know, I would encourage you to like find the authors um, that are doing that kind of thing, um, maybe from, yeah, from your same background and that will sort of like, obviously you're not gonna copy what they do, but it will show you that it's possible. And I think that that's, a really valuable thing to learn. And it is harder uh, in some ways to do, but it is really important work. And so that's the other thing. Um, and the other part of it is, I say that it's harder, maybe, especially if you're a starting out author, but it's also easier for you to write probably because it's like writing what you like and then writing something that you know a bit better. So just the process of coming up with that story should be a little bit easier. Um, and, and, you know, I think on the flip side of that, you're start, you're gonna maybe find yourself in a hole where people expect you to only write again from like a certain, a certain like identity or point of view. And you're gonna think like, oh my God, can I only write Filipino characters or can I only write Pakistani characters? And I feel like my answer to that, and I think different authors will think differently is no. Um, you know, I don't always wanna write only Filipino characters. Um, so if I'm gonna write, a character that's not Filipino, obviously it's a different calculation, but I do kind of think that we should have that freedom to a degree. So if I want to set, if I want to write like a fairy tale type story um, and they're not Filipino because they're in Europe, like I can do that, but I just have to be thoughtful about why I'm doing it that way. It shouldn't just be like a, a random choice. Yeah. And Shweta? So I agree with uh, both these really wise people and like Usman had said, it's a question of expectation, right? Like that marginalized people tend to get boxed in. It's so funny because I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again, everything that we believe is a story. So what we, we have stories about how the world work works and we don't often question those stories because we've internalized them. They become our, you know, the programming running it, or the wallpaper at the back of our minds. And, and we get, and people tend to get, right, like that's what spiritual work is. You start questioning those things and it makes you freak out, right? Like that's ultimately what it is, self-inquiry. But I think we do have to work on changing the stories that we believe about the world. And it's, and yes, like Isa said, you, nobody should have to only do one thing. I made the choice, but that's my choice to only write uh, Desi characters, but that's because I want to help with the, the dearth that we still have of stories. And I also made the choice of writing, again, speaking of expectations, right? And, oh, you know, brown people were always so sad and everything is so terrible and the poverty. Like, I remember I was in New York City when I briefly worked in publishing in my early 20s and somebody in my, in my office came up to me and she wanted some kind of absolution from me because she was like, oh, you know, I could never go to India. I couldn't stand to look at all that poverty. And I was just like, what is it that you want me to say? First of all, I am not from India. I am a born and raised, what we used to call, you know, American born confused Desi, like I'm an ABCD. Um, but even if I were from India, what do you want me to say to that? Like, I'm supposed to tell you, like, I don't understand what is it that you want? But I think it goes along with that whole idea of brown and black people are a monolith, which we are absolutely not. As was fun, so well put it, we can only tell our own experience, our, our own points of view. We are not gonna agree, get any group of us together. It's, we're not all gonna have the same opinion. We're gonna be arguing and saying, you know, no, absolutely not. And agree on some things and not on others. And I feel like the same should go for our storytelling. So I, you know, I made the cho conscious choice that I didn't want to engage in the oppression of being brown, whatever that is. I wanted to write the fun stories that I didn't get to see myself in. And that's what I'm going to continue doing. And that doesn't mean I won't deal with, you know, darker elements or heavier things. Of course, I want my stories to have some substance to them, but that's the choice that I'm making. And I remember when I, when I first started writing seriously in 2006, 2007, I was in Philadelphia in 2007 and I had joined this writer's group and 
I kept getting told that I should just self-publish because nobody would want to pay for money about a book or, uh, for a book about somebody who looked like me. And I just, and I, and luckily I got mad. I didn't, and I, and I just wondered though, how many people stopped writing when they got told something like that? I mean, I mentally just flipped these people the finger. So that was, I was like, I'll show you. And, you know, and I did, it took a while, but I did, but I just keep thinking about that. Like those, again, that unquestioned assumptions that we, you know, the bad stories that we've internalized about how the world works. And like this just assumption that what, nobody would want to read this, but why have you, act, these people, I mean, have you actually stopped and thought about that? Like, why would that be your reaction? Why do you think that a story about a white person is somehow universal and we should all be able to relate to it, even if we come from completely different cultures and, and, and uh, countries, but a story about us that's well told that is accessible is somehow still of not of interest. Why do you think that is? And then if, and then to, you know, what Isa was saying, why do you expect that it has to be this one kind of story? Like, why are we not allowed to tell anything? I mean, that's part of what being a writer is that you're, you're exploring, you're making things up, you're having fun. That's especially part of what being a speculative writer is. You're speculating, you're stepping outside of boxes. And because I remember even I would read, and you know, no shade to these authors, but I would read some of the the popular literary fiction that had come out of India or even in the states, like Jumba Lahiri. And the funny thing is, with her collection, um, the was it the Emperor of Maladies? I forgot what the name of her first collection was. But in any case, most of the stories in that book were told from the point of view of a Desi person. But then there was one that was told from the point of view of a white woman, and hilariously, that was the one I felt like I could relate to more, because. I often felt like there, this, the way that that these stories got told or these books got told, it was almost like they were written for the white gaze. The way that they made so much of being Indian or being Pakistani or whatever it was, they make they, they, it became this problem to contend with. And and I was like, but that's never how I felt. I mean, I'm certainly I've dealt with racism. I've you know I've questioned my own identity when I was younger. There was even a sad period where I wished I were white. All of that is true, but like that wasn't the whole of who I was. I was certainly, you know, I was, I was nerdy. I was in love with Link from the Legend of Zelda for crying out loud. Like I wrote Zelda fan fiction with me and Silver Triforce. Like, where was all this stuff? You know, where, were, where was just the having fun or, or like just, and that was, that stuff was never there. And I just, I, I remember Marianne Mohanraj once said that there was what she called the red sardi cover problem. And that's exactly what it was, that it was all these books that had a woman in, in a red sardi and no head, like her head would just be cut off. And, and it felt like that was, it was exotifying us. And it was, it was selling to the white Western audience what they thought India and Pakistan and so on should be. And I was like, I don't want to write any of that shit. I'm sorry. And I, maybe I, I should have <laughs> like, I don't want to write that. That's, that. that's not what I want to read. That's certainly not what I want to write. And I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to show you world that this is not all we are allowed to do. And, and I think, you know, luckily that's starting to change the we need diverse books movement was a huge boon, a huge help. And though, like Osman said, there's still that ugly expectation. We're still seeing books sell that shouldn't be honestly, uh, especially when they're written by outsiders uh, taking us and exotifying us again and writing, you know, flattening us into this stereotype. But, but I think we can continue to change the stories that we're telling both in just being who we are and having these conversations and getting people to start reconsidering why they think the things that they think that they've just swallowed, you know, I don't think most people actually be would believe those things if they stopped and questioned. It's just, they didn't, they just were given this idea, this re received wisdom, if you will. And I, I wisdom in quotes, because clearly that's not wise, but and they just didn't stop to, th to think about, hey, is that actually true? So I think our, one of our jobs as storytellers, one of them is absolutely to entertain, but another one is to get people to question. So I like, I think that with all our work, we're doing just that. And I'm looking forward to the, you know, the next wave of authors to come who be inspired by us and come out and bring even more, you know, depth and breadth and beauty to, to the genre. And I'm so excited to see what they come up with. And that was a lot, so I'll be quiet now. No, those were all brilliant answers. Thank you so much. Um, that's sort of it from the questions that I had uh, ready, but I know we have some questions from the audience, but I was thinking it would be fun if before we got to those, um, I would invite each of you to read an excerpt from your newest books. And I know, Osman, you are currently on your lunch break, so thank you for taking the time out. So maybe you should go first, just in case you have to hop off the call. Oh, you're muted. I was saying I'm going to try to see if I can find something to read from because I'm currently resource challenged um, <laughs> in terms of my old stuff. 
right. Um, if someone else wants to go, I'm happy to let them go, but it'll take me maybe one second. Okay. So um, Shweta, do you want to start us off? I did the same thing where I was meeting. So I was saying, <laughs> sure, I would love to. And I wanted, I would, I would need to make a special shout out to this cover though, because if you can see it, it's, um, if I can take one second to just talk about it really fast. This goes along with what I was saying about how we should have fun representation. I got very, very lucky with my publisher and my editor. It, and my editor is a white woman, but she gets it. And when, and she asked me from the beginning, she said, it's time to start thinking about the cover. Do you have any thoughts? And I said, I can imagine a really beautiful text treatment of, you know, with stars, but I think it's really important that we put Sheetal, the main character on the cover because we still don't have enough good representation, especially in, in magical ways. And she said, absolutely. And they, and then they did the Corinna Lip and uh, Charlie Bowater got made this absolutely amazing thing where just, and they took all my suggestions, like giving Sheetal a bindi and a tika and jewelry and everything and having her hold her Moonlight Lotus. She is so unapologetically unap Desi and Hindu and so beautiful that this cover, I know it has sold books just because people, they've said this, they're like, I don't even care what the book is about. I just needed to have this on my shelf. And I was like, for a bra that to happen for a brown girl cover is so amazing. And that's what I want for all of us. So I just had to say that. And uh, so, you know, so, uh, so everybody should ask for the best. Don't let anybody pigeonhole you or tell you that you have to have a red side cover or whatever. Have the, the story that, the cover that actually reflects the amazing thing that you wrote. So. And so, uh, as I was saying earlier, I'm going to read from chapter seven, which is uh, when Sheetal and her, her best friend Minal and her auntie Radhika Foy are going to look for the magical night market so that she can hopefully find a way to save her human dad, which it, she doesn't, of course. But so Radhika Foy turned the car right onto Oak Tree Road and little India came into view. A golden mist had replaced the mortal stores and restaurants a gauzy mantle behind which a carnival of stalls glittered, beguiling against the darkness. The night market, it had been here all along. How many times had they come to Little India as a family to go shopping for desi groceries and clothes or for a vegetarian tardy or chat at their favorite spots? And no one had ever thought to inform Sheetal that there was magic for sale too? They'd been arguing the whole drive about exactly that. There was no need for you to know, Radhika Foy reiterated. From the back seat, Minol poked Sheetal hard in the shoulder, but she ignored the signal to shut up. No need. You and your questions. Radhika Foy sucked her teeth. Let's just do what we came here to do. Her face was impassive, even disapproving, but her hands shook as she parked on the vacant street. As soon as the engine turned off, Sheetal stomped out of the car. She felt as limp and wrung out as an old dish towel. And what she wanted more than anything was a hot bath and spice drinking chocolate. And oh, to wake up from the nightmare that she put her own father in a hospital bed. Did the market sell that? Radhika Foy quickly caught up, Mino beside her. These people are not trustworthy. Stay close to me. As they drew near, the market shimmered into solidity. An arch in the shape of a peacock's fan appeared before the entrance. Its feathers were composed of segments of glass in teal, green, cobalt, and violet, all of which glowed from within. Forgetting her exhaustion, she still drank in the light, letting it slide down her throat and into her bloodstream, but froze when the peacock lowered its house-sized head to study her with living eyes. It let out a cat-like cry. Radhika Foy tensed as if to run, her own eyes wide as a cartoon character's. Beta, get back, both of you. She still didn't. Meeting the peacock's disturbing stare straight on, she said, we're here for the night market. It's not going to eat us, right? Minal whispered. If it does, it was nice knowing you, she still whispered back. It felt nice to joke for a minute when everything else was awful and unpredictable to know she didn't have to do this alone. She did hope it wouldn't eat them though. The peacock blinked once, twice, then opened its beak until the entire archway shone through it. Just beyond, figures moved, tinkling laughter, laughter merged with baritone chuckles and out wafted scents so fine they could only have come from the heavenly realm. Dad, Sheetal told him, praying he could hear it somehow. This is for you. Then she linked arms with Minal and they stepped into the peacock's mouth. Behind them, Radhika Foy made a choking noise. Before she still knew it, she stood inside the market, its sinuous allure slinking into her bones and her blood. Music swirled invitingly through her as she gazed at the glimmering horizon. Her thoughts bloomed with wonder, all jewel tones and rein reinvigorating hope. If there was a way to save dad, it would be here. All around them, Intricately decorated stalls overflowed with impossible goods, and the patrons who browsed them were just as odd. A family of Kinaras, 
their equine heads fusing seamlessly with their human lower bodies, examined a carved copper lantern encrusted with gems and colors she still had never seen before. Nearby, an Upsa, who might have been sculpted from marble, she was so enticing, haggled over a selection of black and silver, silver bottles shaped like birds in flight. But I want green, she said, her mouth set in a perfect, her perfect mouth set in a pout. I'm sorry, said the stall owner, a young man who could himself have been the hero in a Bollywood love story, but all I have in stock is what you see here. She still stood rooted to the mosaic tiled floor, trying really hard not to ogle. By accident or ardent wish, she'd stumbled into a mythic wonderland. It was all so strange, so seductive, that if this had been any other day, she would have been raring to see it all, taste it all, to unearth rusty keys to hidden cabinets of curiosities and gulp down streaming, steaming purple potions that would center on adventures in imaginary realms. Sheetal, snapped her at the cuffway. Meenal, she gripped Sheetal's arm hard enough to bruise. I've been trying to get you to listen for 10 minutes. Come now. 10 minutes? It felt like 30 seconds. Sheetal fought to loosen herself from the night market's glamour. How could she have forgotten dad? Meenal, too, looked dazed. This place, I could lose myself here. We need to be careful. Ah, yes, said a sly voice far too close to Sheetal's ear. A young girl brimming over with want, stewing in it like vegetables in dark. Want goes so well with rice, wouldn't you say? A wrinkled brown finger beckoned. Sheetal stared down its length to find an old woman in a maroon and gold sari. Come to my stall, child, and see if we can't find something to plug up that hole in your heart. My heart's not the one that needs help, Sheetal said. Everyone's heart needs something. It seeks something. The vendor scurried back behind the counter of her stall. A cream, a charm, a confirmation. Radhika Foy sniffed, but waved Sheetal forward. She, stared, uh, she shared a, a cautious glance with Minal, then took in the tent before them. It might have been an illustration in a storybook. Fireflies floated from the roof on delicate chains, illuminating the assortment of wares in lavender, powder blue, and hot pink light. They were pretty spectacular wares, to be sure. Diamond-eyed onyx spiders that perched in customers' hair, weaving elaborate cobweb headdresses while whispering arcane secrets in the arachnid tongue. Bouquets of silver poppies, garlands of co copper jasmine flowers, long-stemmed rainbow roses, Bottles of serenity and stillness, bottles of chaos and creation, gems containing heart, freshly harvested dreams. How about a potion to help my dad's heart, she still asked. Some hearts, said the vendor, as if she hadn't heard, seek their reflection in the form of a lover's rapt gaze. She thrust a silver hand mirror at Sheetal, ordinary but for a single brown eye where the glass should have been, as if someone were peering through the frame and winking. Sheetal nudged the mirror away. That was not how she wanted Dave, her boyfriend, to see her. Not that she cared what he thought anymore. No thanks, if you don't have a potion, can you at least tell me if you've seen anyone who plays the harp? The vendor cackled, I have a better question. Tell me, do you know the secret at the center of a rotting mushroom? This is foolishness, Radhika Foy told them. Come, Diglio. In another stall, Mino asked after the harp sisters while twirling a golden apple on his damp branch. In a third, Sheetal picked up, then put down decanters of black beetle wing wine and unguents for forming a peridot carapace of one's skin. Wonder steeped in her like starlight. I want it, all of it, Minal murmured, her voice heavy with longing. Promise we'll come back? She still loved this place, all the glorious things, all the ghastly things. She could spend the rest of the night spellbound, but they hadn't found either the Harp sisters or anything to help dad, never mind a way for Minal to get to Swerglo. We will, after. Then, across the way, in a stall so impenet impenetrably dark, the night paled next to it, she saw a jar full of marbles, each an infinite, entire world, infinite worlds, like infinite stories, the old yearning tugged, heart sore in her chest, a pull towards something else, something she had no name for. The flame at her core kindled. Here, it whispered, she could be seen fully and freely. She picked up the jar of marble worlds. Ah, said the vendor, a waythal cloaked all in black with a hooded yellow stare every bit as shrewd as a spider's. You pursue it even now, do you not? Your place in all things, a place to belong. She still felt coated, coated in invisible slime. Had this creature, a spirit that had possessed a corpse to get around, just read her mind? I'm looking for the Harp Sisters. Do you know where I can find them? Find yourself first, little child caught between. Always floating, always seeking, the way Thal said. His smile grew sharper. Did I mention that with practice, you can visit each of the worlds in the jar? For a sliver of an instant, she still let herself imagine slipping away to another world, one where she might find answers scattered like coins from a changed purse, or better, an alternate timeline in which Chalumati, her mother, had stayed. Dad was fine, stars walked freely among humans again, and Dave had no ugly family history, a place where she still could just relax. That sounded like the true hem heavenly realm. She was so tempted, it hurt. My price is so small, a pittance, merely a piece of you. 
I know, how about a prized memory? An image broke through her thoughts. Charumati's warm lips brushing five-year-old Sheetal's forehead the day dad unscrewed the training wheels from her bike and gave it a first push into independence. I can do it, mommy, she insisted, nervous but trying not to show off. Take them off. You're trying not to show it. Take them off. The memory strained to uproot itself and sail toward the Vethal's open flask. Sheetal shoved it and the jar back down. No. Dave's grin shone in her mind, followed by dad's disappointed ire. Too bad today hardly counted as a prized memory. She'd give that up in a heartbeat. A year of your life then offered the Waythal, leaning over the counter. You would never miss it. Minol inserted herself between them. Nope, not ever. Why are mortals always so certain their life is worth living? The Waythal growls, though his smile remained wide and eerie. Even the most wretched among you clings desperately to the same miserable existence you pray to be rescued from. And I think that's probably a good place to stop. So. <laughs> Those are wonderful descriptions. It makes me want to like draw all of that scene actually. <laughs> Please do. I've been waiting for fan art and I haven't gotten any yet. I still want to see all this brought to life. <laughs> Done. I will do so. <laughs> okay. Usman, do you want to jump in with your excerpt now? Sure. I do have to leave in about five minutes. So yes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read from a story called Ishq. Um, it's, the, it's the first story in the collection. I'm just going to read a short excerpt, hopefully. They whispered Parveen is in love with the Shakargandhi vendor. Figures, said the shocked neighborhood women. Fitting that the girl with polio, the 17-year-old girl with the face of an angel and the leg of a hobbled horse who stood at her window every night staring into the ghostly depth of narrow alley would steal glances at the bright-eyed boy with muscles sharp and confident in his back and a smile on his lips. When Hashim went with his basket of steamed sweet potato up the alley, yodeling at the top of his voice, Shakargandhi wala, Shakargandhi wala, many a middle-aged lady sighed dreamily and leaned out of a window to watch him go. Come taste my wares, his lilting young man's voice teased. Come take a bite of my sweet potatoes. And they wanted to go, wanted to take their drawstring purses, abandon the baby carriage in the hall, with its shit-stained linen, abolish all principles of a vaguely understood domesticity, and run screaming after the sing-song boy. Wait, oh please wait, one packet of shakagandhi, please. Stay a moment, won't you? No, you're charging too much. Leave my alley now, you lying scumbag, but throw me over your shoulders and take me with you. Such sins that our daydreams are made of, the women watched the sweat of Hashem's labor trickle down the brown lobes of his exquisite ears, watched his bare chest shine with summer heat. And in the evening, they'd gather in the cool, sprawling gardens near Masjid Wazir Khan and make fun of the boy. Who would ever go with him? They'd ask each other, wide-eyed, and laugh nervously. Who would go with this beautiful, lanky, young fool who never stopped grinning? Seemly then that Parveen was the answer, the pale girl whose high gloomy room looked down upon the alley from a dusty window. Every evening she leaned out red and yellow bangles slipping down her willowy arms until they shone in the dark like jewels. They clinked above the din of the street, Kanak Kanak, a soul song borrowed from centuries of Punjabi lore. And the girl's eyes would be restless and lustless until they riveted on the boy peddling toward her house. Hashim's route was fixed. Each morning, he biked down the alley, navigating the narrowest points on foot. Come dusk, he walked his bicycle up, smiling, yelling to laborers and shopkeepers returning home to try his shakargandhi. He had a sweet, affecting voice, and when he was not hawking his merchandise, he sang Sufi love verses that pealed in the night like bells. Ranja, ranja, kar di Everywhere I turn, I see Ranja. So long I've chanted Ranja, Ranja, I've become him myself. Call me Ranja, sisters. Don't call me here no more. Carefully, he decorated his wick basket with his shakargandhi. Blossoms of sweet potato wedges sat skewered on toothpicks ringed with slices of lemon, a presentation to tempt the most jaded taste buds. And the people of Narrow Alley responded. They gathered around, waited for him to sprinkle chaat masala over their purchase, 
and munched the shakargandhi all the way home. It was on one such night when the boy clattered down the alley, good-naturedly tinkling his bell at pedestrians, that he happened to glance up into the mounting black. A stick figure stared down at him, circlets of light at its wrists. Their eyes met, the bangles chimed, a new dark surged, and the sweet potato vendor of, never, of narrow alley never looked away again. I'm going to stop there. That's a perfect place to stop. Um, and since I know how this story ends, I'm just like, everyone needs to read your book. <laughs> so you. I'm, I'm actually going to take uh, leave of you guys. Thank you so much because I'm getting uh, uh, messages, pages from inside. <laughs> so it's lovely to be here. I'm so glad I could see Isa, you and Shwera and Ruhama. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you guys have fun. Be Thank safe, you so much for fun. taking the time out. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Isabel, would you like to read an excerpt from your upcoming book? Yeah, I'll read a pretty short passage. Um, it's from a new story. It's a novella, uh, and it's called A Canticle for Lost Girls. So this is one of those that was based kind of on my high school. <laughs> um, okay, so it opens this way. Have you ever noticed yourself on your knees and thought, oh, I don't like this? I'm braiding Andy's hair, struggling through a complicated style I found on Pinterest when she catches my eye in the mirror and says, mommy, how did you and Ninang CJ and Ninang Tisha become friends? Andy's eyes are humongous. There's a deep dimple on one of her cheeks. She's incredibly cute and I don't think that just cause she's mine. The only thing I don't like about her is she has this slight manipulative streak like when she calls me mommy or Ray daddy. Lilting, sweet. Ray always falls for it. I try not to. Is it cruel to think of your own child this way, to be suspicious of her? But I'm suspicious of everyone. Ray can't decide if he finds it unseemly or attractive about me, saying, you're so praning all the time, I feel like I gotta protect you, while he kisses me and cups one of my breasts through my pambahai. I love him too much to tell him, I don't think I need his protection. Our moms were all lunch mothers, so we hung out during lunch in grade one. Then in grade two and three, we did summer swimming classes and were in the same section and joined the cooking club together. I finished braiding the left side of her hair and secure it with a goody elastic. She cries, ouch, but doesn't really mean it. Already, she's squirming out of my grip to check how it looks in the mirror. I still have to do the other side, I say. Okay, mommy, you're so slow, she giggles. I don't want to hurt you, so I'm trying to be careful. Her thoughtless jab stings, even as I think, what am I doing, making my lovely daughter even lovelier? I know what a terrible idea that is. I know so well, I can't even tell her the truth about CJ and Tisha, how we spent most of our time at St. Agnes not being friends hurting each other in that special way young girls do. How we love each other now only because we called the dark as one voice. How that happened our junior year of high school at our spiritual retreat, when we summoned a cruel thing to destroy our CL teacher. How I don't regret it, and I wonder what that makes me, even as I deny the answer. A thing with secret claws, a face in the mirror that swivels, unhinging secret jaws. I'll stop there. <laughs> That was wonderful. That was very creepy and compelling. <laughs> and I really want to know what happens next. Um, well, thank you both so much. We just have a few questions from the audience um, that we can just get into. Um, so someone has said, I loved what Shweta said about critique. What is most helpful for you in a critique group? Uh, honestly, so, so I mentioned that I went to Clarion that the workshop that was had mentioned, I didn't, the funny thing is I didn't really learn how to write. I learned how to critique. So what, that's what I came away with. Um, was it worth going for six weeks? I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, I think what, what the most helpful thing is when people can look at your work and they understand what you're trying to do so that they're not trying to impose their vision of the story on you. Instead, they see what you're trying to do and whether you've gotten there or not, and they can give you advice based on that. So I think it's important to give 
both honest, but kind, like always never be mean about it. I've had people be nasty and that only makes you feel like garbage and that doesn't help you become a better writer. So couch your criticism in kindness, be honest, but kind, but also let the writer know what works because they also need to hear that. And Issa, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll quickly add in. Um, I think one thing I've found, I've done a lot of workshops. I believe in that method because it works for me, but um, there's just people who will get your work more. And I think it's really hard when you're starting out to know who to listen to. It's really frustrating sometimes in a workshop when you get like advice that says do A, advice that says do B, and then they don't like, they don't, you can't do both in the story. Um, but if you if you workshop with the same people for like a couple times, I think you'll start to find like, this person really gets what I'm trying to do. Um, or maybe, and it doesn't really have anything to do with their writing. You know, it's like, it's critiquing is a different skill set. And so when you find the person that's like, when they're giving you comments, it's like resonating with you. Um, I think those are the right people, but sometimes it takes some trial and error. So, you know, I would, I would just encourage you to find the people who help you make the story what you really want it to be. Um, and as Shveta said, like it has to be also um, people who make you feel good about writing and, and the writing process. And maybe I think a really important part of a good critique group is you get you get to complain together, um, but not in such a terrible way that everyone's just sad and negative all the time. Like you need to also be able to encourage each other. Lovely. Um, we have one that's uh, from Chris. <laughs> Um, who says, I'm a white person who grew up in the USA, but have lived in Puerto Rico for more than 15 years. As an unofficial representative of the colonizer here, I have avoided setting stories here. Do you have any suggestions on how I can write about this place that I now know better than the States? So for whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, I think this is like a tricky question and every writer and every writer of color <laughs> will also have a different response to it. So I'll just share mine, which is like when you there's there's like a difference. The difference is if you are a white writer, I may get into hot water for saying this, but it's like directionally right. That is such a privilege already. So throughout this talk, I've been encouraging POCs to write from whatever perspective you want to write, just like Jhumpa Lahiri writing a white woman. If you are a white writer writing a marginalized character, that's really like tricky. And so again, what I would encourage is to just really ask yourself, why am I writing that? Now you're talking about setting, not character. And so I would say like, write about a story set in Puerto Rico and just think very carefully about who, whose perspective you're writing from. I think it's, it's beautiful that you know that place so well and I want you to bring it to life in the way that you want to. But when you're thinking about the identity of your character and how you render even the other characters in your story, not necessarily the protagonist, to just be really thoughtful. Um, you know, if you need to do research, do your research and also um, like do what's true, you know? And so if the truest perspective you can write from is from a white person living in Puerto Rico, then do that. Uh, and it it's because the reason why this is important is because writers from there will probably have a much harder time publishing than you will. So you want to be very careful if you take up that space that you're doing it um, for the right reasons. And maybe that's just what you need to do for the story you need to tell, um, but be very careful and thoughtful about it. Uh, I love everything you said, just said, I second it wholeheartedly. And I would add to what she said about the power dynamic that is so important to keep in mind because since we still live in a ultimately colonized world, like as a global society, we have all learned that white people matter the most. And I don't even think that's the thing that anyone would consciously think, but it's in us. And so we have to work on decolonizing ourselves. And, but we have a long way to go get there. Our systems all, you know, are systemically it upholds what our world upholds white supremacy and imperialism. So as Issa said, you have to be very mindful. And I would say, yes, I, I personally would say, please stick to writing, writing from, even if you're writing in, you know, stories set there, please write from a white character's point of view for two reasons. One, if you don't, because of the way the world is currently set up and the way we think about things, your voice is going to be the one that gets elevated over the stories that are told from actual own voices writers. And that's not fair, it is a mess, it's wrong. We're working toward changing it, but we're not there. So please be mindful. And also make sure that, it, yes, absolutely do your research as Issa said, 
and and pay people who are uh, from that culture to give you honest critique and listen to them. I've heard of so many people who hire sensitivity readers and then dismiss what they say because they really just wanted to pat on the back. Actually listen to what they say. And if you, it turns out that you, you're told that whatever you wrote is being hurtful, do better, ask how you can do better, take that advice and use it. Because again, everything we believe is a story. So we need to change the stories that we tell. We need to be careful that we don't go ahead and like, you know, to use a retro idea here, the, a record, how it has grooves in it. And we keep, we dig those grooves deeper and deeper with every story that we tell, or we start making new grooves with new stories. So we want to be careful that you're not digging those old harmful grooves even deeper. So be mindful, be thoughtful, and remember that this is part of a greater conversation. Remember that unfortunately right now you do have the upper hand simply by virtue of your skin color, which should not be the case, but for the moment is. And write thoughtfully and act thoughtfully for knowing that. Thank you both for that. Um, we have one that says, do you guys research the technical aspects of your stories? I'm not entirely sure what's meant by technical aspects. So I guess any interpretation <laughs> is valid for this. Yeah, I'm, I'm also not sure. That's actually why I'm a little bit like I'm glad that I'm, I'm much more drawn toward magic as opposed to science fiction. I don't really have to worry about those technical aspects. What I try to be careful of, though, is like I was saying, if I'm drawing on mythology, that's not going to be so familiar to because I live in the States and my, you know, my the mainstream audience here is is um, aside from other Desi people who also may not be familiar with our stories or our folklore because of, again, white supremacy and which stories get favored that uh, I want to be careful in how I represent and how I bring these things to the page. I want to make as non-stereotypical as I can. And I want to make them as real and complicated and rounded out as I can. So for me, that would be a quote, technical aspect. Yeah, I think it depends so much on what you're writing. Um, I was just thinking, cause Usman just left, like if you're writing the character of a doctor, you gotta get the doctor stuff right, you know? Um, or, I mean, it depends on the story, right? But if you bring in those details and if you're if you're very specific about what, what the character is, then, then you do kind of owe it to them. Like, you know, if they're using the wrong tool or the wrong terms, it's going to stick out. And I think, you know, there's a temptation when you, um, when you're the only one that knows, for example, I feel like my editors will never be like, this Filipino detail is wrong because they don't know and I know better, but like, I think it is important um, to the degree that you can make it realistic for your story to try to do that. I'll share an example. Um, I was revising a story in my collection um, that had been published actually in 2014 uh, or 2015. I wrote it in 2014, it got published in 2015. And then my editors for my book said, can you take a second look at this story? It's like missing something. Um, and I was like, oh, oh my gosh, it's like five years old, you know, they're like using iPods or something. And I was like, no one uses iPods anymore. Um, but my character is a law student um, from the Philippines. And I made her like study law during summer break. And then it occurred to me, I was like, is that the right time to study for law school? Like, I just wasn't sure. So then I went and asked my friends like, hey, do you guys know any law students? Like, I want to know the application cycle. And I realized like, oh shit, it's like not in, in the summer, it's like in March. And so in the new version, I changed it so that she's studying like shortly after Christmas break. But that was a detail that like no one would catch for me. But if a Filipino law student reads my story, they will know like, oh, it's not summer break when they study, you know? And so it's just one of those things where like, it depends on the thing. But if you are writing fantasy, or sci-fi, um, then you have liberty. For example, I mentioned I'm working on this like story that's based off of pre-colonial Philippines, but I really want my characters to have paper. And I just want them to like write on paper. I don't want them to be writing on like wood, I, you know, wood, I guess. Um, and I can't really determine whether or not we have paper in that time, but like think like all my research has told me not in the way that we think of paper now. Um, and so I'm like, well, it's a secondary world fantasy. I'm gonna give them paper, you know? So, so there's things like that where you just have to like decide um, for yourself and for your story. 
And I, and I want to jump in quickly because I love what Issa said. She's so right. And I didn't, I, I keep saying I'm not doing research and that's actually not true. I just am not thinking about it that way. That for example, Sheetal, my main character plays two instruments and one of them is a harp. And I based that on my, I mean, she's a much, much, much better harp player than I am, but I, but I did take harp lessons. I do have a harp. It is sitting over there out, out of, you can't see it. We could sit on the other side of the room, but I, you know, I, I had to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. And and I'm so glad someone called me out on this in an early draft. I mean, I know better, but because I was trying to show in an early chapter that Sheetal is dealing with her pain by cha channeling it through playing that in, you know, like she plays hard enough to make her fingers bleed. And someone's like, that's really cheesy and stupid. And that wouldn't actually happen. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. Like, no, it wouldn't. That's, you know, and I should know better that at most she's going to get really sore fingers from where the, you know, the, the strings uh, cut into them, but they, and she'll end up with, with uh, calluses that develop, but none of that is going to happen in one night. So absolutely like that kind of thing. I guess that would be technical aspects, right? Or like you, like you said, thinking about a doctor, like I come from a family uh, where it's five generations of doctors and then I'm the purple sheep as I call it, the artist. But so I had to make sure that, you know, I went to my brother who is an ER doctor and I asked him, can you make sure that I got these emergency department details right, the ICU details right? And like, would the machines actually be like this that her Sheetal's dad is hooked up to? That kind of thing, because you do want to get the real world stuff right. Like I was saying, realism adds to the, allows you to ground your fantastical aspect. So you want to get those parts right so that then you can play and do whatever you want with the rest of it. While Ruhama is frozen, I just wanted to do a, a quick, like, fun fact that I also have many doctors in my family <laughs> and in my friend group. And having doctor friends is the best um, for specific writers because you can ask them, like, where should they be cut so that they bleed a lot? And I just love throwing those horrible questions at my doctor friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I think it just booted me out of the call for a couple of seconds. Oop, you're um, so rude. But that's it. <laughs> but that's it for our questions for now. And I just wanted to thank you both so much for taking the time out and for reading to us and for having so much wonderful advice for, for everyone. Um, and for anyone who's interested, well, you all should be interested, the Daisy Collective, the writer's block is gonna continue over the next few days and, um, and weekends. And the whole lineup is up on their Instagram and their Facebook page. And so you should definitely check out the other panels when they happen. And thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope you have a good night slash day, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thanks for hosting and for us. watching us. So. Bye.